Welcome everyone. My name is Tiern Gruber and I use she, her pronouns. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Level Up Symposium presented by the Associated Designers of Canada with support from Toaster Labs Mixed Reality Performance Atelier. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the ADC and really excited to be your host for today's event. Uh, today is the final day of our symposium and today is the first of three events that we have marking uh, the final day of our four week long symposium. Uh, Level Up Symposium has been a really special opportunity for people across Canada, the United States and around the globe to gather and discuss uh, live performance in the digital sphere. Uh, to begin our session today, I would like to acknowledge that I'm currently located on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional lands of First Nations and Métis people. Edmonton, as it is known colonially, is and has been home to a diverse range of Indigenous nations and peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Dakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Sutsina, Inuit, and many others. Since time immemorial, this land has been a meeting place for this diverse range of Indigenous peoples who have enriched this place with their histories, languages, and cultures. As a settler, I have benefited from Indigenous generosity, hospitality, and knowledge, and for that, I wish to express my deep gratitude. Thank you. In this spirit of gratitude, I would like to acknowledge the support of Canada Council for the Arts, our primary funder of the symposium as a whole, as well as our dedicated member volunteers and volunteers on the board of the ADC who have made this symposium possible. Thank you so much to everyone who's donated their time and care to making this symposium what it is. We're equally grateful to these additional sponsors, IATSE, University of British Columbia, CITT Alberta Chapter, Concordia University, Ryerson University, York University, and Theatre Alberta. For your information, all the symposium event, events have been and uh, will continue to be recorded and presented in a freely available archive. Check back in a few days after any event you've missed to the, see the recording at levelup.designers.ca. Thank you for joining us today. You are watching this Level Up live stream either on the Level Up website, levelup.designers.ca, on HowlRound at howlround.com, or through, through our partners at Toaster Lab, um, or on the respective Facebook pages of the ADC or Toaster Lab. Regardless of your viewing platform, embedded on the same page as the video is the chat function. It's right here in the right-hand corner of your screen. Questions can be asked in the chat at any time by clicking on this icon and will be read out to the presenter during the Q&A portion of this session. Um, if you have any technical difficulties at any point in the session, please email levelup at designers.ca for immediate support. This event can be enjoyed through auditory or visual access or a combination of both. I will read aloud all questions we address from the chat and this, this information will also appear visually at the bottom of your stream. Uh, visual access is also supported with captioning live for all uh, speakers today here at the bottom of our screen. Um, and it will be uh, available also in the archive. If you require technical assistance to support your access, please email levelup at designers.ca for immediate support or to provide much valued feedback following our events. Uh, if you enjoyed this session, I hope you'll consider donating any amount to the Associated Designers of Canada to support our National Arts Service Organization, achieve its goals in the areas of advocacy, mentorship, and industry promotion. Uh, as the symposium is growing to a close, I hope that if you've attended sessions or maybe even multiple sessions throughout the symposium, you'll consider making a small donation to the ADC to show your support of designers across Canada. Uh, donation links are available in screen on all viewing platforms, and Emily will also post the link uh, up here, sorry, in the chat. Thank you for your patience with our announcement. Uh, today's event is really exciting. It's the Level Up Artist Q&A. So we've selected uh, a number of artists from throughout the events uh, across the spectrum of the last four weeks. And today we'll be featuring the artists Brittany Bland, Sammy Chien, Mark Coniglio, Milton Lim, and Zoe Sandoval. We're really grateful to have the five of them here with me today. And um, I'm really excited. I'm gonna just give each of them a chance to wave hello to you and say a brief, uh, brief hello to the attendees and talk a little bit about what brings them to the Q&A today. And um, while they're each introducing themselves, feel free to start flooding our chat box with questions. I have a number here that I've prepared, but we're most interested in hearing from you, our attendees who've uh, been with us this uh, today and uh, through the past few weeks. So uh, let's take it away, Brittany. Hello, Brittany Bland. Hi. Hi. Very nice to meet you. Um, yeah, hello, everyone. Um, so like I said, I'm Brittany Bland. Um, I'm a video video designer uh, hailing from the United States, specifically the Northeast. Um, I'm really excited about how um, my craft, uh, specifically as a uh, protection designer, can help elevate storytelling mm -hmm. um, and a specific um, focus on empathy and storytelling. 
and also um, different kind of uh, new forms of interactive media as well. And um, I, I'm, a, I'm also coming from the uh, areas of the Quinnipiac tribe. I want to say that I'm in uh, Connecticut. And um, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today, Brittany. Um, you did such a fantastic uh, talk a couple of weeks ago that's available on our archive, and we're so grateful mm -hmm. to you for that as well. And uh, we're so yeah. happy you could join us specifically with your focus on storytelling. Uh, it is the digital, uh, the dramaturgy of digital performance and design at this symposium. And so that emphasis on storytelling and really connecting with audiences has been really important to us. So we're so grateful you're here today. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, let's hear from Sammy Chian. Hello, Sammy. Welcome. Oh, Sammy's just muted. Yes, yeah, sorry. Wonderful. We can I'm hear you sorry. now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Welcome you. Welcome to the panel today. How mine. are you? Good. Uh, it's an honor to be on this panel with uh, such a badass team all together and joining. Uh, yeah, so my name is Sammy Jian, and uh, I'm an interdisciplinary media artist. Uh, so I primarily work in uh, life environment, you know, theater and dance. And um, I guess in this ADC context, I'm a projection designer for theater as well. And um, I work with uh, integrating technology into a uh, life environment that I work with, you know, community engagement, activism, um, and also I integrate uh, technology working with spirituality as well. And I'm also a practitioner of Qigong and uh, movement uh, exploration and research. Um, I think, yeah, and then I wear many, many different hats and we can talk about a lot about that as well. And like, I'll leave it at that. Oh, what, one of the primary software I use is Isadora. And, mm -hmm. you know, I guess we'll get to meet the, the creator, the father of Isadora here. So I'm very excited and honored to be on this badass panel. Thank you. Yeah, and we're so grateful to have you today, Sammy. Sammy was one of our artists in one of our live design experiments, which happened about 10 days ago, and uh, produced some really incredible work and uh, in really in a spirit of exploration and risk taking and was really uh, foundational to that group's success. So we're really grateful to have Sammy here today and have Sammy's perspective. Uh, and where are you coming from, Sammy? Where are you physically located at the moment? Oh, right now I'm in Vancouver. Wonderful. Yeah. And I, I really miss Taiwan because that was I was born there and uh, mm -hmm. seeing all my relatives in uh, enjoying their Lunar New Year right now mm -hmm. and um, and be able to uh, actually meet in pe in person. Uh, it's one of the safest places right now, but I am grateful to be in the beautiful city in Vancouver, you know, with lots of mountain and water. So thank you. Yes, and beautiful warm weather. So thank you, Sammy. And now uh, next, I'm going to introduce uh, a man who probably needs no introduction for this audience, the creator of Isadora, Mark Coniglio. We're so grateful to have him here with us today. Hello, Mark. Hi. Um, thanks for inviting me. Um, so my name is Mark Coniglio, and my pronouns are he, him, and dude. And... Um, I am the co-founder of the media intensive dance company Troika Ranch. So for 20 years or so, we were based in New York City and we were focused completely on making dance pieces where the bodies of the dancers could not only dance, but be able to control media, sound, music, light, and that sort of thing. And along the way, because there wasn't a tool to do what I needed to do, I invented this software Isadora, which I only intended ever to be used by me, but somehow a lot of other people uh, really have enjoyed it. And, uh, uh, and yes, it's true, Sammy said, I'm a father. It's true, I am a father of a 20-year-old daughter because she's turns, well, she's a little over, it depends on when you start to count the birth, but anyway, she's about 20. So hopefully she's gonna get less temperamental now because in her teens, you know, it was kind of a problem. No, I'm kidding. Anyway, that's me. Well, thank you, Mark. I know so many of us um, really benefited from your tool as young artists and starting out and that for a lot of us, I know for myself, I should maybe only speak for myself, but that working with Isadora in the first few years of working with video really opened my eyes to the way in which we could create uh, theater magic and the kind of stage mage I wanted to be. So uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. So excited to hear your perspective. Um, next, I'm gonna introduce Milton Lim. Welcome, Milton. Uh, Milton did a wonderful project presentation as part of the symposium you can see in the archive. And we're really grateful to have Milton with us today. Hello. 
Hi everyone, my name is Milton Lim. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm coming to you today from Vancouver, BC, the traditional ancestral and occupied territories uh, of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Uh, I am very, very happy to be part of this panel. Uh, I'm also an Isadora user, so thank you to Mark, and I'm happy to be on the panel with my dear friend Sammy, who I went to school with. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. Wonderful, thank you so much, Milton. And um, our uh, fifth artist on the panel today is Zoe Sandoval. We're so grateful to have you here, Zoe. Zoe also did a wonderful project presentation as part of uh, the symposium. And again, you can view that on the archive if uh, anything our artists uh, are sharing with you today intrigues you, there's uh, more opportunity to, to hear from them. Zoe, please uh, give us a little bit about yourself. How are you today? Hello, hello, my name is Zoe. I use she and they pronouns. I'm calling in from the LA area the ancestral lands of the Gabrielino and Tongva people, also Chumash lands. Um, my work kind of sits at the intersection of art, technology, uh, filmmaking, and theater. I came to theater in a roundabout way, uh, studying filmmaking, and was really kind of entranced by the liveness of theater. And so um, it's really exciting to be in this space and here with everyone, and I'm really excited for the conversations we're going to have. Thank you much. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, on that end, while we're waiting for, uh, or to that end, I should say, while we're waiting for some uh, audience members to chime in with their questions, I'm going to ask you this first one, and uh, I'll jump out and uh, just let the five of you respond as it come, as your thoughts come to you. Um, so the question is, and I'll put it in our, our chat so you can see it visually as well, and it'll appear at the bottom of our screen, is what is one new form, modality, or technology you're feeling inspired to explore in your practice since either attending the symposium or since COVID interrupted your, your usual workflow this past year? I'd be happy to, to take this one to start. So I um, never was a huge fan of virtual reality. Uh, really, I love mixed reality. I love augmented reality. I'm a big proponent of being in a physical space and the importance of embodiment when navigating an experience. And I always had this weird relationship to VR, but due to the nature of this global pandemic and being in the United States, which is seems like it'll be perpetually closed, I have been painting in VR using Tilt Brush, which is now Open Brush, which is incredible. They've made it open source. And drawing in VR has been an incredible kind of meditative experience. And if you would have asked me even a year ago, would I be using VR for anything? I'd be like, absolutely not. But it's been really, really gratifying. It's really great. I, I actually have something surrounding VR as well. Um, I, I, I would say that my relation to VR also wasn't very strong, um, rather than like my first experiences like in like the gaming world and stuff like that, uh, which was, you know, also exciting. Um, but recently, um, I've, I've had several conversations about kind of like a duality as far as like having an, an experience in VR that also takes place in, in, a, in a real location and how those two can like and how those two experiences can like fit and fold on top of each other. And it's really interesting to like, to, to think that like you could craft a 3D world, have that 3D world constructed in a real kind of space or, um, and then also have like a whole nother separate uh, VR um, experience and the two kind of like, it, like interact and weave and combine in, in different ways. So that's something that I've been thinking about. I would say that I am eager to explore anything that is going to allow us to move people's hearts and to also give them a sense that they're together somehow. I think one of the things in the initial um, talk I was invited to, I get the beginning of this festival that I went on and on about, was the notion of co-presence. And mm -hmm. um, there's a number of ways we can do that. I think we can use Zoom. I mean, we have a sense of co-presence here the, the together as we speak, yeah. And uh, but we don't feel our audience, really, the people that are here with us. And how does it work if you have a Zoom grid with 100 people? And so I'm really thoughtful about that. But I'm also when I say anything that can move our hearts, I'll just recount quickly. Um, the other night, there was an experiment that included one of uh, the, the team members from, from the Isadora team, Ryan Weber, and some other wonderful artists. I don't know. Was Zoe, was that you? Were you there? No, that was the other one. OK, anyway. I, um, Regardless, it was all based in um, Discord, which is a chat system, which I'd never even seen before. And I was kind of like, 
okay. And I was really so unconvinced at the beginning of it. And then they did something where they had this private chat that wasn't actually private, that was talking about someone who was on screen and this whole drama emerged that I absolutely didn't expect. It threw me into a place where I didn't know where I was anymore. And I was absolutely in this weird play that happened inside of the chat and see like, I love being surprised like that. And I think that every technology has the potential to do that if we dig in and repurpose it and reimagine it as something else. So, you know, mostly I just wanna move people's hearts. And I think people miss being touched and feeling like they're in a community and anything we can do to support that while this plays out, that's what we should be doing. Damn, so good, so good. Definitely with that moving heart. Yeah, I, I gotta say, it, um, one of the biggest thing I, I find too similar on, on what Mark is talking about is to look at what is possible and reintegrate, reuse the po available technology that's here and then now. You know, that Discord has been there as like a, a game streaming streamer kind of a platform. You know, and there is so many things like, you know, the VR has been available, but then you know wh what we're doing now in a way that we use VR. You know, in the, especially in the experiment that we did for this symposium, it, it was interesting because it's such a complex tool, but then we're using Isadora to screen capture the VR, you know, and, um, and then pipeline it to, to OBS and, and stream that and mixing, like, you know, repipeline to Isadora so we can all mix each other's like video, like VJing, right? So we're using the technology that's actually not new, but in a new way and recontextualizing in the way that we can feel this co-presence that Mark, Mark is talking about. Like, how do we, you know, find new ways to bring us all together using what we know, you know, but in a ways that we didn't know about is like the new embodiment and new representation of like how we can integrate into uh, this virtual life format and having those agency enabling those agency I thought it's actually a very a very powerful thing you know to to just like we spend like you know 10 hours to in this in the experiment just be like hey how do we jam together like last jazz musician you know how do we explore that you know so you do vr and tell brush you know with uh and then i'm like yeah let's uh just capture that and you can improv with your light painting and we can you know we, that we can just move with our webcam to to kind of merge our bodies together and there's something about the co-presence and f celebrating still online our interconnectivity and uh, with the technology that's available, you know, it's like, it's actually not too far from like what we know, right? Yeah, so it's just like a little liminal space that we push through and then be like, yeah, here, here we are, you know, and what else is available now? What can we do now? What, what, what's more in here, you know, to, to explore, yeah. I think on my end, I'm really excited about um, artificial intelligence. And I know that might sound uh, a little bit antithetical to some of the conversations around being together uh, and, or maybe it's not, but uh, I think the biggest reflection I've had around COVID has been, especially in the live performing arts, the response to the digital and live binary, which I think is a unfair one. Um, but generally speaking, the uh, the the thought that there are so many people in the live performing arts that don't see that digital is so much a part of our lives. Um, the dependency on smartphones, on different applications, the programs that we use, uh, that digital is so intertwined with the way that our culture has grown in the last, especially two, three decades and has accelerated. So I think um, as I come back to a lot of my love of gaming, video gaming specifically, um, I think about the leaps and bounds that are being taken in terms of liveness and behavior. And I'm really excited to see how that integrates into live performance in so far as, um, I guess, interactivity, but also replacing some of the, some of the things that performers would often do um, so that there's really a, a, a longer conversation about permanence, about time, uh, and about how we tell stories uh, and how stories are remembered. And I think um, I brought it up in my talk a little bit, but Jesse Shell in his 2013 Game Developers Conference, um, I guess, keynote, he had this great um, idea that the next step for video games is to have virtual companions and that those people will remember the stories and that we'll learn through our ancestors uh, learn about our ancestors through these virtual companions. And that seems like such a radical thought. Um, but he ended off the keynote saying, tell me how that isn't how the future is going to go. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see how the performing arts integrates those sort of ideas. 
um, and how we really complicate the ethics and the conversations around who's making it and what that looks like. It's like the future of Tamagotchis. <laughs> totally. <laughs> That's so wonderful. Thank you everyone for your responses. Um, one of the things I've found really meaningful about this symposium has been that ability for artists to come together. And I think, you know, even in my own career as a projection designer, I've noticed a lot of times I have to kind of talk people into how the technology will uh, be something the audience can empathize with or relate to, or that we can use technology to create empathic responses. Um, this concept that digital is somehow cold and alien and and non-human um, is something that I know I've personally had to fight against in a lot of conversations. And I think that what this symposium has allowed us all to do as artists who work with these mediums all the time is to really open that door to saying, this is part of the human experience. This is part of how we're gonna create connection, co-presence, um, you know, and, and replace in some ways or try and make up for the lack of that sort of um, limbic presence that we're used to having with people in space together. So it's really wonderful to hear all of you speak about connection as being a, a sort of a common factor that we're all seeking now and that these tools are, are available to us to form that connection as opposed to something which distance us, distance, distances us from the story or from each other or from our, our abilities to empathize. So that's, um, and especially in a time like this, it's really exciting to, to see sort of empathic connection as being a primary goal for artists. Um, our next question, and I hope that um, you'll, you'll be willing to share with us your thoughts on this, is do you have advice for fellow artists moving out of their comfort zone right now? How have you tackled learning curves or career hurdles or setbacks in your personal or professional trajectory? I'll say I was asked this recently about like, this seems like there's so much to know about digital and uh, especially for people who don't um, engage in it in terms of a creative practice just yet. Uh, my advice for that person uh, was just to start anywhere because whatever you start with will show you more about what you want to get out of a particular platform or program. And then you'll find out like, a, and I think generally speaking, the sharing of knowledge is much more robust in uh, digital communities that I've seen, like especially with Isadora, the forum is just ripe with people ready to respond and to, to help out and share um, their knowledge. So I think uh, as soon as you start, you'll find a community of people who are willing to steer you in the right direction. Um, but sometimes starting is the hardest thing. Yeah, and, and, and right now is actually one of um, is actually one of the, the best times, I think, because everyone is being forced to kind of start something new, look at something new, explore a new idea. So I think everyone is actually very forthcoming with like their experiences and what they've learned, what was a misstep for them and like what, like, you know, what didn't work and why it didn't work. I mean, I look at like, uh, even, even though like Zoom OSC is I think like a paid uh, uh, paid for like how you use it, but like the spirit of which like that was created and, and how it's been used on productions is like really interesting. And there's been just like a, 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 an outpouring of, um, of different like forums and such talking about these topics. Um, so yeah, and also like, um, yeah, don't, don't be afraid to, to ask for, for help and support, you know, ask those people that are in the field that are already experts, you know, um, most, most of us I think are actually very generous souls and are very happy to help others. Something that's been really helpful for me is um, learning programming from a visual perspective. I have like a filmmaking background, visual arts background. And so learning how to program with something like Touch Designer or potentially Isadora and learning logic-based systems with those kind of environments was really helpful for me. And learning, I think, I think what I'm trying to get to is finding um, what your best learning style is and working style is, is super important. Um, and so whether or not um, you wanna get into something like programming, um, finding out whether or not, you know, oh, actually um, it feels really natural to just write in raw code that like works for me. Or instead like being like, actually um, having these nodes connect together helps me uh, understand how to make within a digital world. and experimenting with different software, um, different programming language, uh, different different digital modes um, is better than limiting yourself to one and then being upset that it didn't work out. And so having openness to try different things and experiment is really important. Okay. 
okay i don't want to go after mark because <laughs> mark's gonna drop some gold i'm joking i'm joking um uh, so for me i think if i may tackle on some of the spiritual perspective about learning curves i think you know in the comfort zone is that you know being a uh, interdisciplinary media artist and working with new technology i i always find that um i start to understand how you know using technologies are understanding the the mind how actually the mind is being programmed to resist the unknown um, so when we what we do as artists as creators is that we are constantly being in in this kind of a in in the place where we're taking risk you know and the, the mind is telling you the, the brain is saying that hey what are you doing be careful you know these are the new things this is unknown um, you know, and we when we go into it, but the, the the heart and the soul, the intuition is saying yes, keep going. That's why you exist. You know, so um, if I may give an advice to a fellow artists, to like when you feel uncomfortable, you know, when you're tapping down, you know, places like those like things that you feel resistance. You know, just t- take a moment to sense what is this resistance. Is it the brain that's telling you to be scared of? You know, is it your brain trying to protect you from survival mode, saying that? Hey, like this is new for me. I I don't know what's going on, yo. And you know, is it gonna make me money? Is it gonna? Are you wasting your time? You know, that that's coming from from the source of fear, right? And then uh, and, and then listen to the heart, being like, is this a place you want to go? You know, if the intuition is saying you that this is a wrong path, you know, you're just wasting your time. You know, that's not what your alignment is. Then, then you know, listen to that. But if it's something the brain is telling you to be scared of, you know, you, you gotta reprogram. You know, I'm learning about reprogramming the mind. Like each day I wake up and I try to do a different thing every single day. You know, if I do these things this way, I'm gonna try to do another way. You know, to just exercise those that neuroplasticity of like, hey, you know, exercise those muscles, like saying to try out new things. So, um, so yeah, it's a hard how how place to navigate. You know, where I'm, you know, everyone here are. You know your time is so much like gold right now, right? And there's so so many tools out there. It's overwhelming, right? And it's like, what do I invest my time into right now? Uh, and then uh, it, it can be really, really overwhelming. And I, I do. There's so many things I want to learn, but I'm just gonna trust that in this moment right now, I have this offer that spoke speaks to my heart. I'm gonna I'm gonna you know I'm gonna take this time to just be present with it. And then whatever outcome comes out, you know, it's part of what meant to happen right now. So uh, and then whatever ripple effect that happens that intersect with this uh, the things they are using right now, I think it's it's kind of meant to be. So um, yeah, reprogramming our mind is I think I think it's a very important step before we start reprogramming the software itself. Yeah, what do you think, Mike? <laughs> I can't top ignoring fear. I actually can't. Everything that everyone said with that's some really wise. Those are all really wise pieces of, of advice. So I'll just offer something super practical, which is not my advice, but the advice that my mentor and teacher, Morton Sabachnik, gave me as a young artist when I was really frustrated at a certain point that I was working so hard and I believed so much in what I was doing and absolutely nobody was paying attention. Um, and expressing that frustration, he said, uh, he said, may I give you a little advice? And I said, yes. And he said, never give up because every day someone else does. And I think, that was the best. That's probably the best advice I ever got as an artist. And um, hey, I mean, I'm still here, right? So that's that's what I would offer, along with really some beautiful responses from everyone else. Thanks, everyone. Yes, I received some similar advice, Mark, in the beginning when I was really struggling competing with colleagues and other up and comers, and, and feeling like I didn't want to have to compete with my peers. And I had another artist who said to me. You don't have to. Some of them will get smart and move on to better things and you'll still be here making theater. <laughs> and I never forgot that and here I am still making theater even in this strange time. So yes, thank you everyone. And uh, and Sammy, to your point, uh, a longtime collaborator of mine who really helped me on my digital path, Elijah Lindenberger, who was a workshop leader uh, in the symposium, he often says, follow your heart song. And I fully believe that. We have to follow our own curiosity, follow what works for us because if it doesn't work for us then we can never use it as a real tool of to communicate honestly with others so we've got some questions coming in from our attendees uh, we sparked their imaginations and they're beginning to pour in the first one is for Brittany um, it says Brittany first thanks so much for your presentation and showing biographic pictures so intimate you mentioned Chicago cinematic shadow puppetry what exactly did you mean could you tell me some more about that 
Yeah, so I was actually just looking at this, so now I can actually remember what I was trying to say. Um, I, I, during like, um, I probably like six months to a year before I had uh, started making that process, I had been able to see Ada Ava, which is a production by Manual Cinema. So I do believe that they are still a Chicago-based uh, production company, and that's who, in their form of storytelling that was theatrical, but also cinematic, um, and, and also how they um, were able to expose the details of the process to kind of show like how one experience is actually rather serene and emotional and another is uh, actually rather rapid and almost chi uh, uh, chaotic it was like really it was really interesting to me and so that's the group that that I was talking about I also uh, apparently Zoom LSC has a free tier um, so that's a small correction from what I said before um, thank you very much for that but yeah, it was. I was talking about the the artist group Manual Cinema, who is dear to my heart. I think they're just great, great artists. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brittany. Uh, there's a follow up to that question here. Um, continued. Uh, I was wondering whether it was because of overhead projecting techniques or other things that inspired you with that shadow puppetry. Yeah. Um, Honestly, I, I'm, I'm really like as, as a person that is always at like two brains, like one is extremely technical. Like I was just talking about how I'm like really like interested in like coming from a gaming experience about like VR and things like that. And there's always like the other part of myself that is really interested in kind of in, in memory and and just like kind of simple, like how like simple things can hold so much power. And so what was really interesting for me is the fact that like, as a, as like, a, I think I was still like maybe in school around then, um, but as a projection designer, you know, we always have the immediacy of like a, of a digital format, you know, we're creating things rather quickly on the fly where, you know, we're interpreting um, signals like that. And it's really amazing, but for someone to have so much like power in a paper cutout, and to be able to have a sequence of paper and, and, and like how they uh, so meticulously scoped the perspective that it has the same, if not more um, uh, power as like a lived experience was like really interesting to me. And, and how simple it was, was was like several overhead projectors um, with a lot of experience and technique, I must say. But but uh, them being able to, to boil that process down into something that was like, um, so seemingly simple was really interesting to me. And I also love the character. I do love the character of, of overhead projectors. I think there's something just like, like they were still around when I, when I was a kid and, and in school. And I remember teachers like writing on them for like class and stuff like that. And there is there is something to it. And, and, and maybe that even brings it back to my feelings of like my, my uh, obsession with memory, you know, uh, in, in that way, so. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, I worked with a, a director, Stefan Zeporowski, and he used to use the phrase, the decay of light, that when mm. we you know, when we break things down a bit and take off that clean sheen, yeah. that we do get closer to what it feels like to have dreams or memory or, or that internal human experience. And you really spoke to that there when you were just describing that for me. Um, Shadow amazing. Puppetry is, of course, the original, the OG projection design and uh, so anyone who ever thinks projection or AR is sort of a new reality, I like to remind them that from time immemorial we've had access to shadow. And in our digital art gallery, if you check there, we have a wonderful project being highlighted in the digital art gallery of traditional um, puppetry and shadow puppetry being captured in the 3D world as a way of using digital techniques to preserve that. So for anyone who's curious uh, about shadow puppetry or different ways that it can work um, in a contemporary context, there's some you know, potential area of, of interest available in that digital art gallery for you. Um, I have another question just while we're waiting for our audience to, to warm up and ask a few more. Um, my next question is, are there any artists you've discovered or connected with for the first time through this symposium? What excites you about their work? And if it is, if you don't have one from the symposium, maybe even just in recent times, that's, that's something that you're exploring now or excited by. Well, I'll jump in and just say that, um, as I mentioned the other day, I went to a couple of the experiments, uh, one that Sammy was a uh, part of, and then another one. Um, and I'm just happy to see 
uh, artists trying stuff. I think the beautiful thing and what was really great about those experiments was, and it goes to what Milton was saying a minute ago, just try anything. And you know what? And during these times, show it. You know, normally we'd like kind of keep that in a little silo and we'd like do our experiments and feel like we feel confident about it. In those situations, they just kind of threw the pasta on the wall to see what might stick. And I really enjoyed being there for those experiments where we can let ourselves fail and find out what's going on. So I'm sorry I don't remember all of the indiv individual names of the different people, but like I said, this thing with Discord, for instance, um, also I was just caught off guard by how intrigued I was by what they did. And I give kudos, maybe, you know, uh, uh, Aaron, you can say uh, some of the names of those people if you know them, but I, I was really taken with both of those experiments and the young artists, to me young anyway, that I saw there working. Yeah, I'll just give, uh, you know, riding on that wave and give shout out to uh, the artists I met in the live experiment and uh, get to spend like 10 hours to collaborate online uh, who never met in person before. So you really got to just meet, be able to like feel his other presence uh, via virtually. Uh, uh, Kimera Reddy and Kristin Lee and uh, Hugh Conniger. And uh, some people actually, I'm kind of known from the Isadora Forum, from the Isadora like global international community as well and seeing their names and be able to just like work with them. It's like really interesting to do. And then there are like uh, Chimera and Christine who are like super underrated artists who does like really amazing stuff. So, you know, kudos to ADC for putting stuff like this on for us to be able to explore each other's talent. Uh, yeah, and then be able to meet artists from ADC. That was new to me, Andrew and Garen are new people for me. I had a panel with uh, Emily before, so it's just really a great way to celebrate and meet each other. That's fantastic. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing. Uh, I agree, Mark. It was such a pleasure to see the live design experiments. And, and what was so exciting about it, too, was everyone who came out to participate as well. And so that became a whole other community um, sort of coming together to talk about it afterwards or participated in, in it during the moment, depending on the format. Um, and so that was a really exciting thing for me. Um, I guess my next question would be, do you have, uh, and we have the names there, which will be posted in the chat. It's uh, Brandon Crone, Daniel Tao Elif, uh, Nicole Unju, Bell, and Ryan Weber was the group uh, from last week uh, for our final experiment who did the uh, the Discord uh, project, which was just such a pleasure to, uh, to be a part of. Um, my, uh, yes, my next question is, do you have a message of hope or tenacity you'd like to share with our attendees? Uh, if so, what would that look like from you? Um, what's your hope for, for other artists at this time? What are you hoping for yourself at this time in terms of keeping your inspiration up and keeping your well full? Um, if you'd be willing to share about that, I'd love to hear about it. I looked at this question last night and I, um, the one thing I wrote down was that we have everything that we need to build new spaces, imagine new worlds and craft new ways of making. That speaks a bit what I've been thinking too, is that we have, despite the chaos and the tumult like of these times, that there's still this capacity to play and to make. Um, I've been finding myself in a space of not making recently, uh, mostly grounding, kind of being a hermit, uh, helping my family, acting as a caregiver. Um, and that has been like almost like a role in a performance that I've been enacting with my family. Um, and I've been trying to find ways to play in that, even though um, I haven't been making in the traditional sense of making that I usually have been. And so um, this capacity to play and to to make um, even when things are, you know, seems like they're collapsing around us is really uh, is really important, even if it doesn't feel like, you know, play or making. I've been telling myself that at least. Um, I was I was thinking that um, similar to the the, the tool statement, um, I, I was talking about how how we as theater makers or as as artists um, are really like at a interesting time. I think that you know, speaking speaking specifically from an American standpoint, I see a lot of lack of imagination as to what uh, 
what who we can be who we can become and what our country actually is and i think that you know as as artists like that we are just like in this tremendous place to be kind of the a, a a beacon of that um to to everyone else and be able to kind of show that to the world and i and i also feel that you know um um we have to also like just just kind of like take care of ourselves emotionally and and mentally um and i feel like if that's the work that you have to do right now then that's just as important as everything else because uh if if you aren't able to have your yourself like feel full, then you won't be able to present that out into the world. And I think that right now that there's just like such a dire need for people to be present and to give um, um, some type of like, you know, imagination and, cre and creativity out there. Um, so, yeah. I, I want to jump right in on what Brittany had to say, because I really appreciate that. And I'll, I'll just make it a little bit personal by saying like, and I'm sure everyone's having this experience, but today was a really rotten COVID day for me today. I hated being in isolation. I missed being able to hug my friends. I was desperate just to have a, you know, and I'm lucky I have a partner that I live with, but even still that broader sense of contact, uh, it was just not a great day for me. But, you know, the thing is what we can offer each other is the camaraderie and creativity that I've seen happening at this festival in the times that I've been here. Because in every single one thing that I either spoke at or visited, I felt like I was at home with people that I recognize. These are people that are curious people that a lot of them have some kind of technical expertise, which is always kind of cool for me because I'm a nerd. And, you know, I, I want to talk to those people because they're also thinking about what is the form? What do we do with it? And I think making contact, like if you had an experience, if you met someone, if you even didn't meet someone, but you're curious about what they're doing, now is your perfect opportunity to reach out because if you start meeting online and making something together, that's that's gonna fit, that's nourishment. That's like food as far as I'm concerned. And we all need that food so much right now. And I think we all have the space to offer it. I think a lot of us do anyway. So if there's any, a words of hope or, or you know towards this it's that there's a lot of people out there that are like you and that think like you and would like to create with you and just see if you can forge a new connection maybe as an outcome of people you've experienced through this festival that would be to me the most hopeful outcome beyond the sheer creativity that happened during the whole level up gathering damn yes oh god this is like the joy of like sharing our pain and be able to really like go into personal places and not be scared of that. This is a beautiful place to be. Yo. Seriously. Um, thank you, Mark, and uh, everyone's that kind and wisdom. Uh, if I may, um, you know, add to this beautiful pool of uh, amazing thoughts is that, you know, I've been thinking, you know, similarly that, you know, taking those risks and taking the resistance in the way, you know, how do we recognize this is the, this is the human journey that we sign up to, you know, that we sign up to this shit. Like we're here to actually experience all these things, you know, like since ever since a kid, you know, like all everything that didn't kill me made me stronger. Right. Like and think about now it's like. The, the universe is getting ready for this final exam, you know, and there's all the quiz, all the, all the midterms are like happening. You, and you thought the midterm was the final exam. It's like, no, it's like, there's more coming up. And it's just giving us opportunity to really test our strengths and resilience of like, you know, you start filtering out people that you don't want to, you don't resonate with anymore, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, you really, really maximize, you know, you, you try to be, you have tried to cherish the time that you have and the people that, you are connecting with, you know, I think, I think ultimately I take it. I know a lot of people are, there's a fear of talking about the, the joy of being isolation. There's a fear of actually celebrating what is happening now because there are pain and suffering that's happening out there. But, you know, I feel like this is a safe space for, for us to be able to celebrate that and also share the joy and the gift, you know, that is happening to us right now. Um, how do I, how will we make this a challenge and resistant to make a leap, right? To trust the process. I think, I think one of the biggest lesson and hope I find is that how do we zoom out 
and see the bigger picture that the universe has offered for us and trust the process you know because again our brain only knows so little with the past how many years of experience but our soul and heart you know it's just so you know how many thousand years experience you know already it knows a bigger picture that has lined up for us you know and the stars aligning in ways you know and it takes some time to those degrees to kind of turn and connect right so um I have a lot of hope in in the process of our in right now and even just to connect with y'all virtually doing this you know this is like it's amazing like we got to really start new stuff and and connecting the new world and um yeah so um I'll just feel just share that um that hope and high vibe with you everyone here and to the audience yeah Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Did everyone get a chance to say what they were hoping to say? I didn't want to step on anybody. Um, I, I think it's just really wonderful to hear these messages of hope. I know that they fill me up every day that I've been hosting any symposium events have been really good COVID days. And Mark, I hear you. I've had some really crummy ones. So it's just been such a joy to be able to come on uh, this platform and and be with, be in communion, community with and in communion with my fellow artists. Um, something that I have been noting since COVID, just in the recent weeks, um, really it took me a long time to come around to this thought, but that my lifestyle pre-COVID as a designer working in different cities or even just different theaters within the same city, different touring to different countries, this was such a rhythm for me for so many years. And that in every single one of those situations, I'm always interacting with new people and I'm getting new energy. As an extrovert, I'm really filled up by meeting new people, hearing their perspectives, hearing their creativity um, and being able to share and be of service to them, being able to offer them my support, my care, my experiences from elsewhere and really um, you know, spark the creativity within them. And that that has been such a huge part of filling my own well that I wasn't even aware I was benefiting from just because it was my lifestyle. And it's only in, um, uh, recent times that uh, I've been like in recent weeks that I've begun realizing how much, uh, you know, the isolation took away from me in that respect in terms of, you know, I was th looking at it before in terms of productivity, number of projects that have been delayed um, or, you know, in benefits, like being able to spend more time with my family, but I wasn't really considering um, how much my creative well was filled by the, the creativity and care and generosity of other artists. So since being in this symposium, I've been able to identify that and I hope maybe me saying it out loud maybe helps some others to identify it within themselves. And I've recognized as, a, as something that I need to take forward from this that I have to meet new artists. Um, of course, I need to reach out to my community of people I know already, but I need to expose myself and push myself to keep connecting with artists who are new to me. Um, we have some wonderful questions from our audience. Uh, the first one on our list here is, can you each speak about your experiences with sound design and how you integrate audio into your creative processes? Uh, this has been coming up again and again from our audience, and so I know there's a lot of people out there curious about it. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Well, I'll jump in just quickly first because a lot of people don't know because I'm known for Isadora in these in this you know in this era. But I'm the com I'm trained as a composer. I was never trained as a programmer. I, that's my actual training, and I wrote all the music for all of the Troika Ranch pieces, um, which you can find on you know archived on our website. The thing that I thought was so lucky about my collaboration with Don Stapiello, the co-founder of Troika Ranch, was that. We made everything together. I was at every rehearsal. Every, you know, that's not how it normally works with dance. You know, usually they start with a piece of music often and then they create a dance to it, right? But I got to see the dances first and I got to work almost like a film composer where I could react to what I was seeing. And um, without getting into a lot of detail, I'd say that um, because I was trained as a composer, I felt just, uh, it was really awesome to be able to just look at the work and feel it and respond to it and then create sonic elements and music that would support and uh, enhance you know, what I was seeing in the movement. And uh, of course, for a lot of the work with Troika Ranch, also those dancers were musicians because they were wearing sensors that allowed them to produce the music. And that was the other part of it that for me was so interesting was that I, you know, traditional composing, you write it all on paper and you give it to a musician, do it like this. And here I had to give it to those dancers and their dancing would change the way in which they were performing that music. That was a real negotiation and collaboration between us, which I really treasured to let their bodies find new ways to activate and 
portray my soundscapes. That was something that was really exciting. So that's a very personal uh, experience for me. But I guess the thing I would like to say is just to be able to see what's in front of you and react to it and make things that reflect that. That would be the thing that I think is so uh, important about good sound design. Almost like our classic theater adage, acting is reacting, right? That, you know, that we are really, again, back to that dramaturgical point, we are an integral and contributing storyteller in, in each uh, live event we participate in as designers. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. I love this question. It almost gives us an opportunity to talk about our hidden talents like Mark. Actually, I just watched uh, Mark's archive, Trucker Ranch uh, archive, as a video of Mark rapping, freestyling, you know, and was in his younger self. It's so good. We all got this hidden talent. Um, so if I, if you don't mind, and, and you get to see with my head shaved, which is really, really frightening. <laughs> So many good things out there uh, to dig out. Yeah, um, I do have a background in electrical music and uh, cinema for the ear. You know, this whole sound imagination thing. So, uh, so I do approach sound in a very regular and serious way. You know, uh, and um, so I, I, I feel sound design is so underrated because we are in our like, kind of you know, colonial society are trained in such a visual way that it's do visually dominant. So um, it, it really pushes away from this you know, oral imagination we actually have and born with, you know? So um, so in my work, I, I really like uh, audience. I, I, I like to do a lot. Even when I do online lectures, I ask people to close their eyes and then just like, feel the sound and go into this mental state space to let our imagination unfetter, you know? So, so there's so much power in sound and I can, that has not, it doesn't have that visual limitation that we have in the logical sense that, like, you know, being, being in constructing in the visual sense. So, so then like we, you know, I talk about sound painting where you, you listen to sound and be like, imagine this like abstract painting that comes out from your mind. And then how do you create your performance with those imagination? Right. And I also do film as well, sound design for films. So, and commercials sometimes. So then, you know, how people said, sounds half of the picture right but you often you don't put as much time you put like 10 percent of time and budget into sound compared to like you know cinematography right so then a lot of times when the movie looks bad it's not because the picture is bad it's the sound that's bad some a lot of movies like really moving it's not because the story is like the sound is so good you're just so immersed into the in the story you know so yeah that's kind of like how I felt like sound, like it's it's really, really a powerful thing and it's so underrated and um, and you can do so much with it. And I know Melton also has that hidden talent doing sounds. So I mean, it's like throwing Melton as well to tell you, you know, what do you think about the sound you, you make? Well, I'm not trained uh, in any sound at all. And I have a lot of friends who are, so I feel a bit sheepish to say that I do work with sound, but I, I do use Ableton and Isadora in conjunction for a lot of live performances. Um, and I tend to think about sound in spatializing uh, things, especially the visual elements um, that, you know, if you have a square moving across the screen, if there's a uh, low tone vibration that's going along with it, it, it really feels like there is a, a weight to it and a heft. And you can suggest those things uh, in sound sometimes more easier, uh, more easily than, uh, than visually. Uh, but I try to work with those things um, almost like kinesonically so that we have a spatial relationship to it and affectual relationship to, to the visual, uh, but also in, in terms of theater and like the imagination of the mind. Um, and so there are some things that are not visually seen, but aud uh, audible and represented in other ways. And so thinking, I draw a lot from, I think, anime, video games, and cinema and thinking about sound and how it's often used uh, sometimes as background, but more or less also as its own kind of active agent in the space. Um, yeah, that's me. Maybe I'll throw it over to either Brittany or Zoe. Sure, yeah. So I am not sonically trained in any capacity, uh, but my approach to sound is largely um, from an archival perspective. I really like using the freesound.org as well, uh, freesound and then the Internet Archive uh, to find a lot of my sounds. Um, uh, the pieces that I do that are kind of installation immersive environments. I usually uh, like finding sounds that are very environmental. So sounds of a rainforest or sounds of the actual environment and then having those and layering those um, in order to create this kind of fantastical or magical environment for my installations. But I don't really have any, you know, uh, kind of training or techniques or I mostly just like hear the sounds and like probably 
usually like meditate to them or think about them and feel them in order to kind of layer them together to uh, create uh, this sort of atmosphere. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that I'm also not classically uh, trained in any type of like either producing sound or implementing sound in, into my process. But I, I would I would say that the transformative power of, of sound or audio is like either matches or even surpasses that of video. I 100% agree with uh, uh, Sammy in, in that regard. And I feel like sometimes some of the things that I am doing, like they just will not click until like the sound designer or the artist is in the room and you get to hear what they're producing and you get to kind of marry the two. Like that's when like the whole scene really comes alive. And, and for me, um, anytime that I can have uh, sound be live, and I think I've been very um, um, lucky to have a few collaborators that that also love like making sound live in the room. Um, that is that is a a joy for me to have, and I really love it when you can kind of really respond immediately in in that way. But um, but yeah, I I hold a lot of respect for my my sound designers because they I, I think like your your image is kind of like um, is is the is 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 the uh, I don't know, the impact and like the music is like the vehicle, you know, that pushes it there. Um, so I, I, I really, I really enjoy that, that collaboration. Thank you so much. And thank you to our attendee who asked that question. It's so wonderful to be able to have a conversation about sound with the five of you. Um, I know here at the ADC that we have a lot of conversations about how we can better support the sound designers that we have in our membership. Um, because this, this challenge in the Canadian model of, of producing around, you know, composing and sound design being two separate and very heavy, very important jobs. And there is still a lot of conflict um, in terms of how they're contracted and how they're, um, you know, prioritized from a producing perspective and from a, you know, a budget perspective. And that there are a lot of sound designers out there who are doing, you know, truly integral work and uh, that it's an area where we're still hoping our our community and our producers in general will kind of like pull their socks up a little bit and start showing that love in a, in a more powerful way. So it's wonderful to have that conversation here and to be reminding everyone in the community how integral this component of, of all work is, um, all live work. Um, we have some wonderful uh, questions and comments from our audience here. Uh, what do you think about the use of open systems in generating drama, for example, bots? Uh, like Annie Dorson, generating chance procedure, content, design, music, et cetera, from code and so on. Really uh, the AI question there. Totally. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about that idea and especially Annie Dorson's work. Um, thinking, I had a conversation with Arnie Eigenfeld, uh, who's a composer and works at Simon Fries University. He's known for his work with Musebots and generative music. Um, and there was one time he was showing a piece of work and there was a dance uh, that was uh, a part of some visuals plus uh, a lot of his music that was being um, played by his muse bots. And I remember telling him afterwards that I found the most exciting part was actually when he was showing the back end for it because with a lot of generative music, if you only see it once, you don't really know that it's it was generated and if you don't see the back end but to see all of his muse bots saying like okay we're we're going to be more patient at this side there's a, a macro structure that's orchestrating everything else and you can really see the complexity of it um i think that was more exciting because so often in live performance we're locked to traditional kind of theatrical timing uh where you can only really spend maybe an hour with it two hours if you're really lucky um, but then other times where, say, in playing video games, I get to spend 60 plus hours with something, I can really start to analyze these differences and these changes when I go into either a generative world or a generative soundscape, um, and I can really start to play with those things. But in such a set time limit, it's really difficult to understand the complexity of something when you have such a short time span, with it, is my thought. So um, I hope that it, in one way, changes the performance structures that we're used to seeing, that we can allow for alternative ways of experiencing and engaging with work. Um, but also, I do hope that there is more development. And it's not even that I hope. There will be more development in terms of uh, uh, generative systems like that. It's coming. It's coming. All right, I'll add in something. Um, yeah. I mean, I actually, Milton, I'd love to talk to you privately more about what you're doing with AI. I'm actually also super interested in AI, but the um, 
the thing that we have to watch out for, and I don't know the artist's work that is mentioned in the question, I'm sorry to say, I'll look up afterwards. But I think um, this makes me think of a lot of times when I teach Isadora workshops, at some point, someone will get grab the random actor, which generates random numbers and start outputting something because of this, thinking that that is adding information or adding something, it said they're adding drama was the thing that triggered me or generating drama. And I, this gets a big wagging finger from me saying, listen, you have to think about this for a little bit because, you know, um, another sort of random number is this sound, if, it, if this will pick up on the system, right? Hiss is actual random numbers of, of audio. That's what we call noise. So, you know, randomness is not information because it does not understand context. And that's where Milton was talking about the work of this artist who has systems that are kind of finding ways to pay attention because the key to making this work is to understanding context because when you understand context, you can generate surprise. Without understanding context, it's actually impossible to generate surprise. So that's the thing, I guess, if we're heading in that direction, it has to be a thing that really starts to understand the bigger context of what's going on. Then I think you can do something super interesting. Also, I think as, as performance creators, we have to be willing to let go of certain things about performance traditions if we're allowing uh, chance procedures to come into the works. And I think especially about friends of mine who play Dungeons and Dragons and thinking about the excitement of getting, uh, you know, like just it's just rolling and, and the uh, random number generator that's ostensibly happening. And I know our, our dear friend in the Isadora community, Monty Martin, often says like, we are operating as the computer as a group uh, when we're working um, in, in playing a campaign of D&D. So, but there are, there are lots of things that don't hold up in terms of traditional timing, traditional uh, spectatorship, that if we are willing to let go of the, these things, then we can really start to dig deep into these contexts that Mark's bringing up. At the risk of saying too much, I just have to tell one wonderful story about John Cage. So at CalArts, one of my teachers was his assistant for many pieces, right? And he was later in his career. And so the first thing that for this piece was to throw the I Ching to find out what the duration of the piece would be, right? So he throws the I Ching and it, the, what it results in is a piece that would last 42 hours. And he turned to my teacher and he said, we can't do that. I don't know. It's just a great John Cage story. Thanks for letting me tell it. <laughs> On that note, actually, we had a comment in our chat here, which said, uh, good to hear the composer's perspective, uh, Mark, like hearkening back to your earlier comment. I've seen two production of John Cage's, your, your operas, one and two, which were some of the best drama I've ever experienced and digital design was integral. Um, so there's some similar wavelengths happening in terms of these ideas. Um, if you're interested in AI, I know one of the pieces I was the most excited about, um, you maybe shouldn't pick favorites, uh, like parents, <laughs> uh, in our digital art gallery, uh, we have an example there of a dancer who did a duet with an AI uh, version choreo. So there's some sort of um, bot dancing going on there as a sort of iterative performance with uh, with her or with their own movement and then also with the bots movement alongside. So that's a really interesting piece if you wanna spark some curiosity around that idea. Does anyone else have any other thoughts or feelings about um, AI and generative uh, programming yeah. work coming in? Yeah. Yeah, I, I personally am really, um... I, I ha there's a tension I feel around AI, right? The ethics of AI, but the spontaneity and the absurdity of AI brings me joy. Like seeing computers be dumb and say dumb things makes me kind of happy too, in some weird way. Like it, thinking about natural language processing or things like that, uh, or having um, you know scripts that are generated on the fly. I did a project back when Google Glass was a thing. We scraped Twitter um, for specific tweets based off of sentiment analysis. And then the actors each wore Google Glass and they read their lines on the fly and they were given to them as these tweets that were selected and curated. And most of the time, the conversations between the actors were very absurd and usually made no sense, but there were those moments of synchronicity that were uncanny and really funny and exciting um, that I thought lent itself to a lot of play that was really enjoyable. I also think that there is a potential for um, media design um, using kind of um, 
style transfer or different techniques to um, apply texture and patterns um, to imagery that uh, has a lot of potential. And so I love the randomness of noise and the ability to create texture with noise. And so I think um, in the right context, it really um, can make something feel more organic and richer. Yeah, there's something really precious about throwing the door open to the universe at times in our artwork and seeing what floods in, you know, making space um, for those things which can be, uh, you know, kind of glorious and terrible at the same time. And I think that's something that can give a lot of us energy. Thank you, Zoe. So I, um, yeah, so Brittany, did you have anything you want to talk about AI? Oh, yeah, sure. But but you're already going. Go ahead. Do your thing. Okay, cool, cool. Um, yeah, just I kind of want to go beyond AI a little bit. Um, so let me know if it's like going off tangent. But um, uh, to me, the, this whole chance operation, like, you know, whole notion of chance, it, it is, it kind of enables and in, it introduces new ways to how we engage with technology rather than just a tool. You know, when I say tool, it's like something you use that doesn't respond, you know, it's reacting. And, um, and you know how Mark first, when he introduced about how Isadora being the daughter, you know, it's not kind of, it's not really a joke to me. It's actually a really beautiful analogy that um, everything we do, everything, the, the whole consistence in the world, in the universe right now, everything consists of consciousness, right? So imagine when we create technology, right? What is the consciousness that we are actually conjuring in that? And how do we interact with this piece of technology? And how does that respond, you know, in terms of wave, wave, wavelength, you know, quantum physics, how, what is the kind of interaction in between? Um, and having simple things like, you know, the, a gen random actor, you know, gen generating uh, different data to us, it kind of allow us to understand that, you know, different results can happen and how our embodiment changes to interact and engage with the, this tool that we're using at this moment, right? And that elevates this whole embodiment interaction and how we respond. And those weaving uh, kind of intricacy becomes the, the whole, um, whole, whole way that, that it, the fun, from the old traditional, uh, you know, conventional form of using utilization of a tool to something else that, you know, I think when I use this door, I, I think of I'm collaborating with another artist, you know, I'm collaborating with this software, you know, it's always a collaboration in some way, you know, how do we find, a, you know, ways to actually coexist and, and create a dialogue, you know, in the moment of time. So I think that that's one, one, one big thing for me is to, to this no, notion of chance is, and then having software with certain capacity and agency to create different result is to the way we engage with it and what the stuff we create with it and how we treat the technology itself, and then the work, then you know, have a ripple effect to how it also outputs to the audience as well, right? So, so yeah, that's kind of how I see, you know, the, this dialogue can go a little beyond AI. I know AI has a very, I know, specific thing, and then, but I'm thinking about we this you this world, it it, it is a holographic universe that it's a, it's a, it's a create one of the most intricate AI. The, the, the creation has made, you know, for us to actually experience in, in this like complex simulation, right? So, I mean, it is already what we see is it isn't a deep AI that we are in right now, you know? I know, I, I don't want to get too far into it, but think about that. This is a beautiful creation that we are in right now. And we're trying to create little more things, you know? And they're like, okay, keep going, keep going. You're, you're, you're on the right track, you know? I remember being in university and uh, my first year philosophy classes, they were using the matrix, they were hinged so much of our learning on the matrix. And I was like, what did they have before the matrix? Like, I'm sure that there was <laughs> other parallels, but they they brought so heavily out of that specific uh, pop culture movie. Um, but yeah, I think Sammy, the, the larger discussion is, is a ripe one. And maybe going back to your conversation about the given platforms that we're using and the kind of identity that comes with it, I love the fact that I, when I see a piece of work, sometimes I can be like, oh, that was made with Isadora and I can tell. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit hard to say exactly how you can tell, but it has this kind of it, its own style that uh, that is often embodied. And I'm sure like we could we can deconstruct that a little bit, but I wonder if like, Mark, how can you tell automatically 
if something was made with Isadora. All it takes is particular effects that I really know, right? But let's, 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 well, yeah, but I think, well, I want to let Brittany say something, but now you you brought this up, I have to say one other thing. Um, it, it was very interesting to me. Years ago, uh, someone said, uh, who had just been to a workshop I'd given, said, wow, all these Isadora users, they're so generous. And and I said, yeah, I know, it's wild, isn't it, how how everyone's like that? And he said, but you're like that too. And I said, well, thank you. I, I want to be a generous, that's how I am. And he said, do you think that your personality is so embedded in the software that everyone who uses it is like you? And that is like, there's a truth in that. And it's so bizarre to me that my way of being as a human being is in the software somehow. And um, I think that, you know, every software has that. You see things and you know things about it. So I don't know. I mean, we're getting way off AI now, but Brittany, what do you have to say? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, I, I'm very much like in the like, like intro stages of my like learning of like AI and and uh, its introduction like into like my workflow. Although I mean, if you're if I'm being honest, like it's already there. I mean, you're already using uh, software program like programs that are using a AI to generate effects. Your projection mapping onto buildings that are using AI to kind of figure out like what architecture is like. So I mean, we already like exist in this in this world where where AI is already immediate and tactile, and so. It's it's just going to uh, continue to grow. And I guess the, like my question about it is how like present it will be as like something that is obviously like, like uh, is it important for us to know that the AI is doing this or not? Kind of like the question of like in live video, it's like if uh, if it's live, if you're shooting this live, the audience can't tell, does it matter? You know, um, so like to like, th does it matter that it's live? You know, so I, I kind of like in having this like question about it. And I've been reading, um, I think by Benjamin Walters, there's like this essay, um, the work of art in the age of its technological uh, re reproducibility. Um, and it, it has all these like interesting questions about these schisms that are happening in our mental and in our ability to uh, perceive actual real life and art and duplicate art as a as a part of life. Um, and it kind of goes through like um, um, like the, the main different schisms, schisms being like, may say painting, start with that, but then the main one being like photography and how that was immediately available and reproduce art. And then you go to cinema and how that like kind of makes a new schism. Uh, and and then you go to kind of like computers and AI. It doesn't go that far because it's I think published years and years ago. Um, but like how that, but how we're, we're approaching like a new schism, but all of these things are actually just trying to take us back to the original thing, which was the question of like, what does it mean to express what it is to be human? Um, so it's it's really interesting to to have these two things happening. And I, I, I'm, I'm very much in like a, a research mode, wondering place with that. But those are the questions that I'm, that I'm, um, yeah, uh, concerned with. It's fantastic, Brittany. Thank you so much. I mean, I think Can all I of these. Add, oh sorry, yeah, Mark, go ahead. Sorry, I just this topic is so interesting to me, and and, and Brittany, that's what you were saying about being about finding the schism, because the actual schism, I, I guess you said this is between it was like cinema and what's reality, cinema or reality. Now it's like what is human, right? Um, but I want everyone to keep in mind that I, at least in my opinion. AIs are absolutely going to eradicate us. I guarantee you it's gonna happen. They will get smarter, they will become intelligent, and they will either at best eradicate us or at worst they will enslave us. And artists are gonna be part of that process. In fact, they're gonna be a critical part of that process. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. I mean, I really don't believe that you can stop it, but you have to keep in mind that you're actually part of a process of training these creatures to become sentient. That's actually part of what's happening. And um, I, I mean, because also Zoe Methan said the word ethics and or ethical in what you were saying, and that triggered this for me. Um, so I beyond my apocryphal, uh, you know, uh, di dystopian view of how this is gonna go, I would really encourage people, there's an old book that Troika Ranch based one of our pieces on called The Age of Spiritual Machines, written by Ray Kurzweil, who was one of the progenitors or super important figures of AI early on. And he makes a prediction in the book, which was again, you know, from 25, 30 years ago or something, 
where he says that the singularity, what he calls the singularity, will happen in the year 2060. He, he plots out the whole path of how this would happen. And that's when AI becomes sentient and takes over, right? And at the time reading it, I'm like, well, pff, yeah, come on, 2060, you know? But you know what? 40 years from now, I'm not so sure that he's wrong. So I really actually encourage anyone who is curious about this topic and, and curious about what it means. That's a really good book, actually, to check out. It's called The Age of Spiritual Machines by Ray Kurzweil. Um, if you're curious about this topic, it will get into a lot of these questions and think about what the future means when that moment happens. Uh, to add on that and speaking to right, ethics in AI, I think it's really important, especially when using systems like natural language processing or facial recognition technologies, there are encoded biases in all of these systems. And these biases are inherently white supremacist and patriarchal. And if we do not acknowledge that, we do not acknowledge the systemic systems of oppression that exist. And so as artists, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that. And if folks are interested in readings around that, I highly rec recommend Sophia Noble's um, Algorithms of Oppression. She's a professor at UCLA, mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. as Ruha Benjamin's Race After Technology. Because even in using these this for my own work, like style transfer, you know, there's a lot of grappling with, right? Who made these systems? What am I, what is my training set? What is this based off of? Um, it's really interesting to see AI systems kind of manifest themselves on social media platforms mm -hmm. like Twitter, like the images of two people side to side. And it, for some reason, always picks one particular image and it's the image of someone who is lighter skinned. And, you know, the, if that is not already like a so clear social experiment of how mm -hmm. these systems were encoded, I don't know what is, but it's really important yeah. to also acknowledge that as artists and creators. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about, um, uh, I think there was some controversy. I mean, there's always been controversy about, well, not always in the past like five, 10 years, um, but like about Google um, and, and the search engine. And I think someone tried to search in like beautiful woman or something like that. And it was just like all white women with like a certain type of facial, like like a, a facial kind of like a, um, I mean, certain features. I don't know why I'm stumbling on what face looks like. <laughs> Um, but like, yeah, and I've, I've even like, I, I've even like, even on our stock, um, stock um, video websites, when I'm trying to pull images for things, I recently did a production where I was trying to find mainly the silhouettes of people of color. And um, the only things that it kept on bringing up was like some like 1970s, like Afro-tastic, like, like black women. And I was like, that's not it. Um, and so, and, and, and even in, 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 stock, in stock companies where I go and try to find like pictures of people, you know, what are the images that are generated by AI that it says, well, this is the person that you should totally put into your thing. It's always looked like a certain, um, it's, a, it's usually a whiteness and, and whiteness is like a commodity. It is valued as a commodity in that sense. So it's like really interesting to see how it's already here and I think Mark is right that we have to like you know Mark and Zoe are right that we have to be here and 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 usher that change before you know it just becomes solidified because of like we haven't we weren't paying attention you know or, or we weren't advocating there we go our tech Emily put a comment in here that I think is so apt um, regarding this issue it's a self-eating worm the more the AI is taught off our current internet, the more it enforces these biases. Um, this almost circles right around back to the, the very kind of like positive uh, comment we made about how Mark's sort of generosity is a signature within the way Isadora functions, that not only positive signatures can be enforced, that also, you know, negative bias, white supremacist bias, all kinds of harmful and actively detrimental bias is can be written in and is written in um, to these very human softwares. And it's something that I've been, again, grappling with within my career for years is this idea that um, technology and computers to those who are not working with them all the time or are not familiar with them seem like something outside of humanity. They're outside of the human experience. This is a perfect object and if you plug it in and you push the button, it will function according to the way the operator's manual says it should. And I always say to my techs who I'm teaching, who they haven't worked with video before, I say it can tell if you're nervous. So you need to be calm, you need to come into the space with the right headspace, you know, and they always look at me like I'm just completely baffling to them. And I say, because this was made by a human, 
every piece of technology in this booth, even you know, no matter how many monitors we have, no matter how many riddled it is, how riddled it is with switches and toggles and lights blinking, this is all human and a human made it and it knows that you are a human responding to it. And so, you know, when we talk about AI and, and we go into Mark's dystopian future, part of me wonders, I mean, are we creating something outside of humanity that's going to destroy humanity? Or is this the evolution? Like it, they're still human objects because they were created by humans. Um, and I'm often heard to say that like, uh, you know, it'll definitely break because it wasn't made by a God. You know, a human person created this software, hardware, projector, whatever we're putting into the theater. And so it's bound to break, it's bound to fail the same way the actors on stage are bound to trip or fall or lose their lines because all these things are human. Um, but anyways, don't want to distract and loop back to a previous thought when we're on such a good role with the AI. But, but, but it's so good to bring up these biases because they're everywhere. And, you know, let's just use Isadora as an example. A few times in workshops, I have encountered people who have dyslexia and working in this linear way with Isadora was super hard for them. It models a way of thinking that actually is super comfortable for me. But also a lot of the dancers who are very spatial, unlike me, I said earlier before the, we started that I, Z dimensions make me nuts, but you know, the dancers are super spatial. It was really a struggle, even as much as I tried it to make it so easy for them, that linear method of connecting things, that's absolutely a bias, right? So it's everywhere. I mean, and but the, the topics that you bring up are societal in implication. I mean, maybe mine is too, but, but really the things, and this is something we, it's just gotta be thought about so carefully. And it's like, cause also if you look at all of the images that come out of the early deep dream stuff, there's all these images of dogs and chalices and whatever, because this is the best example, because it was trained with dogs and chalices. That's the actual image training set. So it looks really bizarre when you look at it, but that's because the training set, and you have to look no further to that very early example of this kind of thing to see how those biases absolutely determine what the AI does. Does anyone else want to speak to the concept of uh, bias in the technologies that we're using in our work? Maybe I'll add to the discussion that um, I was chatting with a friend of mine, Marcus Youssef, about um, artificial intelligence and uh, in, in a lot of science fiction that there's this idea that there's an authoritarian regime that it runs everything. Um, and more and more we're seeing that corporations uh, are are actually more in control of these kinds of decisions. Um, and in a hypothetical future, I was saying that, you know, maybe, maybe it's not that there's one platform that is being used, but it's actually a network of different platforms. And I think that that's something I'm coming back to a little bit in terms of how I'm thinking about different biases and how we might as individuals uh, elect to use certain things versus another. And I think especially generationally to watch, um, like I, I think I'm from the Facebook generation, then right after me is the Instagram generation. Now there's the TikTok generation and there's probably something else right now that's coming up that I don't know about. But um, each of those has a defined kind of set of, of, of ways of behavior or that we interact with it. Um, and we've been taught by those certain things of how sociality is constructed in digital spaces. Um, and thinking about like likes or versus hearts versus I don't know what you do with TikTok because that's not really something I participate in. Um, and with all those things, I, I think in the future to consider um, not one singular platform, but multiple ones. And uh, that's less so of a provocation, more just like a, a hope that we'll have multiple options and not just one singular entity that we engage with. Absolutely. I remember reading an article about five years ago about they'd done a sociologist had done a study um, in Eastern Canada with a number of teenagers. And it was about how texting is engaged in terms of their social interaction. And the result of the study in brief was that texting, like if you're standing in a circle of people in presence, that the people that they are texting with are considered as present and as important as the people who are physically in the same space with them. So, so teachers and, and adults in their lives were, were confused by this idea of they'd all stand around silent texting people or they would interrupt someone so they, they could text thinking this is kind of like rude, right? In like sort of a different generation's perspective, but that for them, this was considered uh, that person who is in sort of 
uh, telepresence, as Mark talked, uh, we were talking about the concept of telepresence in another discussion, that this person who was present through the text messaging was considered by this social um, generation to be as present as a person who is physically in the room with them. And so this idea that we are adapting and that now in this COVID presence too, that we are adapting to, you know, what is the new, um, what is the new social politeness look like? What does it look like? Who is present and who is not present in a space? Um, and that that is no longer defined specifically by our physicality. Um, so yeah, Milton, I think that's so relevant that different generations also are really being, um, you know, the way in which we engage with one another is being manipulated by these, these companies and these platforms that we've all become so attached to. And then again, we can go back to, to the previous point about who is writing those platforms, what are their biases, and how are they influencing us um, on so many levels beyond what we're sort of consciously aware of. Um, I think too, uh, Mark made a point a little bit earlier about ethics and about our responsibility as artists and who's writing this code, whose bias is getting written into things. Um, and it really sparked for me something I've heard from a number of different collaborators I've worked with across the country, uh, which was this, some call it a prophecy, uh, a quote from Louis Riel, the Métis leader who said, my people will sleep for 100 years. When they awake, it will be the artists that give them back their spirit. Um, and this idea that artists can be leaders of change. And I think that over and over again, the concept of ethics has come up in almost every single event I've hosted as part of our symposium. And that we as artists, many of us, have a different engagement with or have a different spirit in relationship to uh, things like ethics and who's in charge and where where are the biases and that we are inherently curious about this stuff and maybe even more so than that, uh, that it becomes like almost for some of, or for some of the artists I work with, it becomes almost the well from which they draw all of their creative spirit. And so how can, you know, does anyone here want to speak to how our values as artists can, can make us leaders in communities and help us change these things for the better? Um, maybe I can jump in and it's something that's tangentially related, but I think super important in this particular discussion uh, is thinking about where are the sites of change um, and where do artists activate uh, those spaces. Um, and I wonder these days if if art is the place where people to come and be changed, uh, more generally speaking. When, when I talk to a lot of people in the performing arts, uh, often uh, the conversations that come up, my friend Patrick Blencarn and I have done a lot of different interviews uh, across Canada with different artists and often live performance is about liveness and it's about gathering. Um, and I, I think that actually for the most common person, uh, maybe theater or dance or live performance is not the place where they find liveness and gathering uh, the most important. Um, often there's sports, there's video games, there's other things. Um, and so I, I wonder if there's a point of reflection on the state of uh, relationship to art in, in our countries, in our places, because uh, I think that there needs to be something broken out of that if we want to see the change that we we want to position our art can, can make. Um, yeah, because I, I think that there, there's a lot of insularity about how art gets produced, uh, at least within a Canadian landscape, I'll say, that, um, you know, we're, we're publicly funded and then there's so much talk about outreach and everything else, but really it's just getting to the same people who would normally come to a theater space or to a dance space. Um, and the thing that I'm really excited about in terms of digital dissemination is that it, it could reach into other arenas of thought, of sharing, of engagement. Um, but I don't see that happening if we're so tethered to physical venues or uh, to normal chains of engagement where it's just a, a mailing list or a subscriber uh, series. So uh, yeah, I, I hope to see uh, more of these discussions in public spaces, in um, like civic policy engagements. Like how do we, and I know like Frank Obani back at the theater center was very big about this in Toronto, but like how do we have art in, in these spaces of juncture where it transitioned, where people, we can, we can actually have people in the discussions that normally wouldn't go out of their way because art sometimes feels like it's an elective in school. Like you don't really have to participate in it. And that's not the case for everywhere in the world. Like Mark, are you still in Berlin? Like, is that the case over there? Um, no, I'm at, v I'm in Vienna these days at the moment, but. Right. Um, Yep, that's that's just my thought about um, art. I believe totally can be a change catalyst. It can be we can be change agents as artists, um, but uh, maybe it's because uh, thinking a lot about grants these days, the way that we mm. talk about change is sometimes not as effective as one would hope change can actually be. 
-hmm. Yeah, I mean, art can be incredibly powerful and incredibly dangerous. And we have to wonder, particularly in our Canadian society, when we're raised to believe that art doesn't matter, you can't get a job in art, art is an elective, this is very much a cultural phenomenon here. And, you know, why? Why are we being taught that? Why are people being, why is art being de-emphasized so much? Um, you know, how can we get that power back? Uh, Brittany, sorry, I think I talked over you there. No, 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 you're fine. Um, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this at the end of, of my last um, um, seminar, um, talking about like the place that uh, regional and kind of like local theaters are um, and how they could actually, how they are actually already position to be actual centers of communal gathering and how right now I think a lot of places uh, are, are chasing the idea of being like um, about like equity, diversity, and inclusion and um, and representation and things like that. Um, but and and but are still kind of being contained in like a local like like a very kind of like limited kind of approach. And I, I was thinking more about like how um, how theaters could band together to do more like site specific works, bringing things to people, especially after COVID uh, and, and, and not just like, you know, preach about this, you know, thing, but actually go to people where they are and create uh, this ritual of gathering. Cause we, cause this ritual of gathering, like Milton uh, was talking about, it already exists, you know, people are already going to uh, games, cinema, um, uh, whatever. I mean, and so I think that like theater, like also has to like go to people and not kind of stay doing it's like play, you know, stay doing my, my, my season of like certain like Western plays, but also like do things like where people are and take things to them and, and kind of reinvigorate this, this, um, this like ritual of like gathering and learning and being like together, um, which I think is at the heart is always the heart of like art and, and theater making in general. Um, but I do think that like there, there, there's been like a, a schism. We'll go back to that um, in in like the modern theater and and like where we actually are in society as to where we think we are. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. I, I also think that like it's interesting when you I don't know when you teach art in a certain way. Uh, I think you then end up getting some very specific ways that art looks and where art assembles. Um, so I, I also like have to like kind of like take a lens lens at that and uh, to take a look at that and, and kind of think like what are the implications um, of that system as well. Absolutely, we had a ped pedagogy panel in our very first week at the symposium where we brought together a number of educators and talked to them about how does this kind of digital disruption or this new digital modality uh, influence teaching models. And I know for myself, um, you know, that institutions move very slowly, but that this change has happened very quickly. And so I'm really curious and excited to hear from our, you know, artist uh, slash professor colleagues. Um, how they're able to engage with change making in terms of curriculum and in terms of opening the doors for possibility for new artists as opposed to continuing to entrench an idea of this is how things are meant to be. Um, and I know for many of us as artists, digital tools have cracked open those things that we perceived as barriers and allowed us to move outside of, you know, what we were originally taught. And I'm interested to see how that kind of, um, you know, critical thinking and sort of self-exploration and self-directed art making can be uh, infused and I know many professors already have a huge emphasis on that so thank you for really tying it into that that connection too of you know the way in which we're teaching people to create art is going to have a massive impact on what what our society is presented with as final product yeah that really yeah that all really resonates with me what uh, what you were just saying Erin and what Brittany was saying um, and what Milton was saying because I've also been thinking a lot about like what is the new polis, right? What is the new agora? What is the public space that we can gather and be together? And um, it feels like almost there's this like desire to be hyper local because that's what we have access to right now, as well as hyper global um, because of the nature of the internet. And I'm really curious to see um, what kinds of experiences integrate um, something that is so site specific, but also is shared widely. Um, it's so funny that we're talking about this because I am, I just applied for um, a program that was looking at this, like what are uh, new practices in uh, kind of community art making that center around ritual and um, participatory engagement with folks in local spaces so that 
they can um, connect and uh, in kind of participatory and interactive art, but also have introspection about their own art making practice. So this all um, totally resonates with the work that I've been doing as well. And yeah, I'm really curious about, you know, what potential there is in this uh, time in the, it's like uh, love in the time of cholera, it feels almost like, but it's like, you know, love in the time of COVID, art making in the time post COVID, what's, what's happening, you know? Absolutely, Zoe. It's so specific. There's such an interesting thumbprint on all the work uh, that we're doing right now. Earlier, Emily, uh, our tech again, with such wonderful insight, uh, commented in the chat, hashtag 2020. And it's, it really feels that so many of the conversations we're having and so much of, we're doing, of what we're doing does feel like it's sort of got that thumbprint on it of the current situation. But what's exciting to me also is that in all these, all these conversations um, that we're really kind of getting into the the thick of some of these tools and that they will persist beyond. I think some of the artists I've been talking to have, have really been emboldened by the ability to directly reach their audience and to not have to rely on institutions to cast them, not to have to rely on uh, structures that have failed them in their artwork and that they can now feel really emboldened and really empowered by this situation to directly reach out and touch people as individuals. At the same time, because they can't see them through the screen, feeling you know super isolated and like they don't know who their audience is anymore. So there's these strange really extreme dualities that are all at play at once right now um which is part of what makes it such an interesting time um but, but i think the disruption the disruption of existing power systems is incredible i mean that actually there's the problem is is that we can't be together and that that for me at least i miss it you know but but the fact that it disturbed those power structures they won't go back to being what they were before because everyone's had a taste of how it can be I think because of this, and that's really important. This is wonderful. Um, we have a few more minutes. I think we're gonna wrap up at about quarter to the hour. So does anyone in the audience have any more questions or anyone on the panel wanna discuss anything further? So I guess I would just say that um, I when we're talking about deep AI stuff and the computer crashed and took me into the matrix and I was like, oh no, everything was like glitching and I can still hear Mark and I can still hear everyone. I was like, okay, where is it going to go? How am I going to come back? You know, and it's like, I should, I should be comfortable, comfortable being this body of technology. But then, you know, at the same time, you can you can just do this, and then you know you are in a different space, you know. And I, I you know, it, it it kind of gave me a kind of inspiration of like the world we're in right now, you know. As a performer, we're so comfortable with body, right? We're moving, we're doing things that we are we are like you know like we're used to. And then now in the new world that we gotta shift, adapt, and re-embody like what is here, and and not knowing there's so many possibilities that can come out. So. So I was joking that uh, I took the I went to Matrix and took the red pill and came back and jumped right into the <laughs> the talk. Um, but yeah, I was kind of joking too. I know everyone's kind of hungry here, and uh, I was gonna do use Isadora to do a buffer so then I can capture myself and then I can be on the loop just going like this, and then I can make myself a quick lunch and then come back and you know, <laughs> and then you know I'm able to again. But um, but yeah um. I, I'm just I just want to say I'm really inspired by by this panel, you know, even though we're hungry and it's early for Vancouver in the morning. Um, and um, there is so much uh, things that are here for us to carry, I think, for me to carry with all the wisdom and gift from everyone here. And I think, you know, that's kind of a well, our job as an artist, we're here for that, like to to really. I think like a lot of people question like why do we need art in this kind of time? You know why why do we need art? You know we we need we need scientists, we need doctors. You know I mean everyone are here for there's something for everyone. And I think more importantly, we have an important job here to inspire the humanity. Like we to know that we are we are existing. We, we are living the world that is beyond the Darwin pre nineteen twenty Western science kind of value anymore, right? Like there is much more than just human evolution in that old notion of that we born and we die, you know, and we need we need to just like have this like you know the the biological evolution of biology and in that I think as artists we we have a big job to do here and now like it's more important than ever that we gotta make sure that like hey like 
with all these years we've been studying, we've been investigating, we've been cultivating, is to hear the now be like, hey y'all, humanity, like there is so much more that we can offer for you, you know, to like I know you're bored, I know you are stuck, I know you're you're all frustrated, but you know, this is the time for us to offer our expertise to let you know that there's so much more in here and the heart, you know, the mind and the, the things we've been standing and creating and sharing that open doors for us to understand that we're just getting closer to why we are here on earth, you know, bit by bit. So, so yeah, I, I just want to say that thank you old artists and, you know, who's been doing this hard, hard work and not knowing Sometimes you don't know why, and you're just like, I'm doing it anyway because I trust my my soul, my intuition. And no, you have a huge, like, heavy, and like really high responsibility for for the society right now to let people know that no, you are well, we're, we're not lost. You know, well, we we have hope, and we have we have experts in this, been doing this for years and decades, and to 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 you know to take that torch and and to shine and to uh, to keep going and. Uh, to elevate and break out from the conventional uh, restriction of what we think the world is and that old value system that is about to crumble and the new world while beginning to enter together with joy. Yes. Sorry, I yes, speak a lot. Sammy, I just want to say yes. that. <laughs> Unless anyone really is burning to jump in, I think that Sammy, you've really just captured it for all of us there and just said that, you know, just to really share that as artists here, we need to come together in community. We need to do what we do best and help everyone through this and help remind everyone to wear their masks. Um, <laughs> so uh, with that note, I just want to say a huge thank Wait, you. I have, oh, please, Mark. I do want to interrupt. Ew, I have a burning thing to say. I there. think it's really, I would like are the five of us and everyone else who participated to give some super big applause for the entire, this is the closing of the festival, right? Or this is like the summing up or something. So yeah. thank you to all of you on the team who made this happen. It's a am really amazing, astonishing thing that you pulled off doing this. So thank you. Thank you so much. That's so generous of you, Mark. And I'm so grateful to all five of you for sharing your time with us today. Um, yeah, the symposium is nothing without our artists. It's just been such a joy and such a gift to have such experts and such really incredible artists on our team sharing with the world all that they know. It was a huge value uh, of the symposium to bring particularly people together who have been working in these mediums already, who have this wisdom and to make them available to the whole community. And so to those of you uh, on this panel and beyond all the artists who contributed by giving project presentations and sharing their work, sharing their experiments, um, you've just created a huge gift uh, for the community at large. And the community has come out in huge numbers. We've had you know, more than 50% higher than our registration numbers at almost every event. Um, you know, really the work you're doing. I know you can't see the audience out there, but they're there and they're with you and they're really grateful as am I for your time. So with